good morning. This is uh, the good attorney, Clemson Paris, broadcasting live from the Intex News studios here in Tampa, Florida, and you are listening to Straight Up the Middle. I'm one of the uh, the co-hosts. The other co-host is none other than the professor, uh, Tony Seabrook. Good morning, Professor. How are you doing today? I'm doing great. Good morning. Now, as always, it's good to be back here in studio. One of my most exciting moments of the day uh, where I get to, you know, you feel like you're sitting on top of the world. You get to debrief all the things that you've seen and happened during the week. And uh, it's great to have some some good, enlightening discussion. So I'm always excited uh, when we get a chance to, to get in studio this morning. Now, you were out last week. We missed you. And yeah, I was up yeah. in uh, I was up in Clear Springs, Maryland, hanging okay. out with my Navy buddies. Okay. okay. Uh, but I'll tell you before we get into it, I went down. I made a trip, especially down to Baltimore, so I could see for myself right. what all the hoopla was about uh, right. involving uh, uh, Representative Cummings. Got it. So I took pictures too, in case you want to right. see them. No, no, no. Yeah, I, I, good? I, I've seen America. Okay. West Virginia, <laughs> Alabama, <laughs> Arkansas. Which I, I've seen America. <laughs> And I would say that Baltimore is America. It has <laughs> it all is. that America has to offer in it, the good and the bad. So I, 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 won't, I won't pick that out to say that's the case. But I've never in my history looked to senators as the cause of problems in local communities. That really is something that um, I, I think everybody needs to be aware of. And, 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 and Baltimore is symbolic of, I think, a lot of places in America that are not getting a chance to – to be part of the dream that America has to offer. And some of this expansion and growth and the greatness that we talk about that is happening, um, I'm, I'm always sad because, you know, you don't get a do-over in life. Whatever it is, when you live it, is what it's going to be. And and those people don't get a do-over. So if we, we fix this stuff in the next 10, 15 years, that takes nothing away from the suffering and despair that these people currently have experienced and felt. Maybe that saves somebody else from going through it. Um, but uh, uh, so I, I'm good without the pictures. I, I've got a, a firm, you know, impression that it represents what America is, the good and, and the bad. Uh, so but I, I, what did you take away from your visit? What came you came away saying, OK, this is what I feel. This is what I, I understand different than what you went into it. Well, I've traveled to Baltimore many times, and that's where I would go once a year for annual meeting, and sometimes I go a couple times a year. Uh, and I like Fletcher's Market. I forget what street it's on, but there's a huge complex. Fletcher's Market. Fletcher's Market okay. uh, uh, in the Baltimore, downtown Baltimore area. Is that where the where there's a, there's, where the, is the constant constellation or constitution? There's a boat dock down there. That's no, that's like Inner a, Harbor. You're that's talking the Inner, Inner Harbor. Harbor. Okay. Right. Uh, but it's I'm a real tourist. Right. right. You know, I go, <laughs> <laughs> I go to the real tourist spot. the constellation. Spot. Yeah, right. okay. All right. There you go. Uh, and we took pictures at the constellation. But, yes. yeah, the thing was. It, it is um, a constellation. <laughs> Yeah. That, that's the name of the boat. Okay. Constellation. Got it. Constellation. Yeah. Um, the thing that I took away from it is I acted like a tourist all those years that I went to Baltimore. Okay. Uh, I would take a cab over to Fletcher. Uh, what is it? Uh, Fletcher. I think it's Fletcher's Point. Okay. Um, and just overlook the rundown neighborhoods, the rundown buildings. But uh, with this particular conversation and, and where I line up politically, I, I wanted to see because I truly feel – I agree with you that uh, Congress can't solve the problems, but I believe uh, many of the congressional representatives, both senators and representatives, uh, fail their districts. And if you were to go and since I went there, I was looking for it. So I was looking right. for and, and really, to my surprise, it was right in front of me. Got it. Livingston Street, I mean, all these rundown houses to the point where I was taking a picture of the roof and the roof looked, at, looked like it was falling down, but there was a for rent sign on it. Got it. I mean, this. Yeah. I mean, I was looking for it. You know, you, you right. tend to find what you're looking for. Got it. Yeah, and 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 I mean, it, I mean, my thought would be, is it any different than any other city in America? You know, my wife asked me that question, and I would say, yeah, it's much different. First of all, you know, it's it's a big northern city, and it's a um, with the public mass transportation. Um, you don't see that here in Tampa with all the problems that, you know, I hear and we always talk about transportation and what's going to happen. I know you're a Tampa native. Right. Um, but I don't see any of that. Uh, maybe because we're you red mean the, re the rebirth, the regrowth. Some of the stuff I know we have in Tampa and a lot of big cities is the gentrification. Right. Which is usually what le you know, it's, it's really those those communities. I don't know of a place or a city and we can take D.C. The two big examples I would look at well, mm -hmm. three would be Atlanta. D.C. 
and in New York. And I remember as a child visiting Atlanta and there was nothing really. You go down underground and it looked like your, you know, everything in that little mall was closing down. This is this mid seventies. It was about to close down. Well, you know, it was yeah. like that in the mid nineties when I lived there for like right. six months. I, right. I heard about the underground. I went right. there and I was not impressed in the but, least. Right. But but that was the only thing Atlanta had at that time. Now Atlanta has a lot of other areas. It's gentrified right. and brought in uh, uh, you know, torn down, you know, dysfunctional housing and things of that nature and built other structures and communities and stores and things uh, to the chagrin of the people that formerly lived there who can't afford to live there now. Uh, no different than you go into certain boroughs in New York. The old neighborhood's gone. Uh, mm-hmm. They've torn a lot of the stuff down. And you see, even if you go up in Harlem, you see the, the, the creep of gentrification coming north, uh, uh, you know, coming into, into Harlem as well. Uh, you go over to Chicago. That was one of the big issues about them rebuilding the stadium a couple of years ago was it was going to knock out a lot of the you know income, low income areas and things of that nature. And people fought and you know spewed and spat it. D.C. as well. You know, we go up in Georgetown now. I mean, it's the place to be. And, you know, everything costs a million dollars. Back in the late 70s and 80s, when I used to go up and visit my sister, mm-hmm. you, you dare not. You, you go down in those areas and some of that kind of stuff. So. My, my issue is I get that is a reflection of what that area is. I struggle with the accountability for Congress. You know, I, I you know, Congress can bring you money, I think, in certain aspects. Mm-hmm. But how that money gets spent, for example, let's take uh, Hillsborough County, for example. Um, Congress can, you know, our congressman and Kathy Castor mainly and, and, and under, uh, is it Bill... Um, the senator that just uh, defeated by... Uh, um, oh, uh... I can't think of the former senator. Look how quickly we forget our, our our political leaders when they're gone. But anyway, so but they were you know Bill very. Nelson. They fought to keep the MacDill Air Force Base open at a time. Bill Nelson at the time they were trying to close bases back in the mid '90s due to the economic impact. Charlotte didn't win that fight and had to go in a different direction. Other communities didn't win that fight. They ended up having bases closed or cut back on their military footprint. Also, well, that was under uh, President Clinton, right? But I'm just saying the idea was the president. I mean, the the idea was the local guy fought to Mm -hmm. keep that in place, and that's what I'm trying to. I'm trying to connect your accountability to Cummings to what happens on a local level, and so ultimately, once you fight to get whatever you, you want in place, eventually that money hits the ground, and it has to be turned into something at that point in time, whatever Congress goes. But I doubt he's going to be able to coordinate. You know, rebuilding houses, tearing down this house, negotiating a new grocery store coming but in. But the issue that that you have, and that sounds good because you're painting a, a great and a lovely picture. But the issue that I have is if he's been how long he's been in Congress, like twenty seven years, if not more. Right, probably more than that. So you you can't convince me that he has been uh, effective at at least holding Baltimore to a certain level. Right. Um, the pictures that I took with my own camera, uh, right. forget the pictures that are all over the Internet. I mean, so at some point he is accountable. Now, he's not the only one, but he certainly is accountable. You, you can't be in Congress well, well, that long that, then, that now, district. Now, now, what they said is, though, I think the per capita income is lower in Mitch McConnell's district and that the poverty rate is higher. It's higher in Mitch McConnell's district. In Mitch I McConnell's agree. district in, in Kentucky, Kentucky. In Kentucky. And that whole Appalachian area, and that's why I mentioned that. Mm-hmm. You go in there, you talk about despair. Let, you know, it ain't nobody coming. It, it's, it's really a, that. that. But, but I, I throw that out to say I'm okay with accountability. I just like to be realistic about it. And not poli- You know, I, I, there's a political dynamic to this. But I've never looked to my federal, federally elected uh, people to really, really change, because that's not, it's hard to change what's inside somebody's house or in a community. You need local impetus. There's almost nothing the federal government could have done that would have changed Vinnick's approach to Tampa. He was a billionaire, and he was committed to coming into Tampa and doing redevelopment because he saw an opportunity to make money. And he did that. I can't see how Bill Nelson or Rick Scott or Kathy Castor really is going to influence that they you know maybe the governor can say we're going to do some tax incentives Mm -hmm. and breaks and things Mm -hmm. or maybe we loosen up some lending to allow you more money but because of vinnick's vision we're getting a five-star hotel the jw marriott bill and i'm not trying to do an advertisement for Mm -hmm. but i just think that's the business dynamic of america the reason that neighborhood's poor is i'm gonna tell you exactly why which neighborhood 
in Baltimore. Okay. And I'm going to tell you why poverty exists everywhere. Poverty is profitable. Lots of people who are very, very wealthy make money off poverty, and therefore it's allowed to exist. If it was not profitable, it would be replaced with something else that was more profitable. And that's a scary thought to think about, but that's just the reality of it. All right, we're coming up let's, on. Let's our- sit on that for a minute. <laughs> yeah, that's capitalism at work. So we're gonna come back. Listen, all right. So we were diving down in that loop far too deep. I wanted to, uh, Professor, lead us through some discussions. We're gonna talk about a few things that have happened during the week. So listen, new new change though. Quickly, if you're looking for us on Facebook, Facebook, flip over to YouTube. Go to intouchnews.com. Go to YouTube and click on the little live button. You'll see my smiley face. We'll be right back in a minute. In Touch News Radio, Reality Radio, where everybody can be a star. Um, so let's look. This is Linda Archie with Taiyu Temple United Methodist Church. Join us every first and third Saturday of the month at the Village Market East Tampa, 3206 North Sanchez Street. Free parking, free admission, fresh produce, live entertainment, vendor shopping, and delicious cooked food. Join us every first and third Saturday of the month, beginning June 22nd. For vendor information, call me, 1-888-991-2502. See our ad in In Touch News or Florida Sentinel. Please call me at 1-888-991-2502. The Village Market at East Tampa, 3206 North Sanchez Street. Been in a car crash? Call Ricky. Don't know what to do? Ask Ricky. We will connect you with a lawyer and doctor experience in auto accident injuries. Call Ricky at 844-361-7425. After an auto accident, you have 14 days to seek medical attention. You may be in pain. So call Ricky, ask Ricky for your best options. 844-361-7425. Call Ricky, ask Ricky is a legal and medical referral service. The lawyers in our network pay to receive referrals. When it comes to reality radio, everyone is a star. I know that's right. On your smooth soul and R&B station. On the World Wide Web. Access, Access granted. granted. In Touch Radio. Welcome back to In Touch News Radio. Reality Radio, where everybody is a star. Hope you all are listening in. Uh, well, I guess you couldn't hear me if you weren't listening. But listen, we, had a, we have a change in programming. Uh, so we've moved our video live streaming over to YouTube. Much simpler platform. All you need to do is uh, go to YouTube, open your browser, type in In Touch News, uh, and hit enter and search button, and it will pop up. There'll be a, a little frame there that says live. Click on that, and boom, guess what you got? Oh, and listen, Esteban coming in. My man, Esteban, our engineer, says, and it's being shared through Facebook. So we hope this platform is a lot more stable and a lot easier for you all to use because we want you to be a part of the show. It's a call-in show talking international politics, economics, education, all things that matter to you across the the, the wide, wide American landscape. The call-in number, 813-444-9588, 813 444 Nine five eight eight. Okay, Professor, you've yeah. been out. I know we missed getting into some economic stuff, but you mm-hmm. want to talk about that this morning. Uh, what's on your mind? Well, you know, I was out when the numbers came out. The job numbers came out for for uh, August. Okay. Um, low numbers. I think it was one hundred and sixty four thousand. I don't know if the correction came out yet, but that's pretty much what it what it was. Um, I always look at, and I think I have it here. <clears throat> uh, one of the things that jumped out at me with those numbers was uh, the youth uh, participation in the job market ticked okay. up, which is always a good thing, something that we tend to overlook, uh, but that's a good thing. So youth, uh, you know, that's summer market, and so they're back in school for the most part or heading back at least up north after, um, what is that, after Labor Day? Right. Um, but with that, <clears throat> I think this all feeds into what I think is one of the big things, and we've talked about it before, uh, the, the trade war or the impending uh, – Trade war. No man, there's, <laughs> listen. No, no, the war. There's a war with with uh, China. Now, I heard an interesting um, uh, clip about uh, China is really doing this. The long game is to try to either get President Trump out or or, or put the pressure on him. 
Uh, he's you know, obviously he's in an election year coming up. So if uh-huh. they can hold out long enough, maybe um, you know, uh, I think optics and that kind of stuff, uh, public pressure um, would be on Trump to somehow uh, relent or, or just cut a better deal with them. Um, the first thought is, I guess, is it, it appears that Trump is almost standing by himself. Mm-hmm. I think that if there was a a unified front in this dynamic, it would be China versus the United States. But I feel like this is Trump versus China. But you make a good point, and, and I think it is for the most part, but I think it's one of those situations where people say, you know, that's a good thing. I, I can see an upside if Trump is successful in this. I can see the upside because— Upside for— For, uh, for the United States. Because they get a bit, if he's successful, then he looks like— he didn't look like he went at it alone. Then he looks like a leader that said, you can't see my vision, but when we get there, things will be better. But here, here's whoa, why whoa, he's whoa, alone. Whoa, 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 let me, like, let, me, let me drill in. I got, yeah. You got a couple, my ear caught a couple <laughs> couple phrases. The one was Trump going alone would be good for America, well, as opposed to Trump, Congress going together being good for America. That, that caught me. But no. Trump is not the first president that's taken issue with the trade policies I, listen, with he is China. The, the issue is an absolute certain issue mm-hmm. that needs to be addressed. Right. There is no doubt about mm-hmm. it. What I'm trying to figure out is the approach to it. And you did something here is it's Trump. Mm-hmm. And I've always thought about something Trump said when he ran for office. What's and that? his phrase was, I alone can fix it. That's the approach he's taken with everything. Mm-hmm. I alone. So his approach has not been to get legislation put through Congress or something showing. Well, Congress has been part of the problem. That's okay, though. Congress that, has a very low approval when, rating. When, when did Congress become a problem? The 50s, the 60s, the well, 70s, right, the 80s, the right. 90s? But here's the thing. When? We have a caller calling me to the show. He, he's beating me over the head about Congress, so I'm glad this uh, caller <laughs> is in. Uh, good morning, In Touch News. Who do we have? Good morning, this is Daryl Pope. How you doing? Good morning, Good Mr. Morning, Pope. Darryl. We're doing well. All right, <laughs> so maybe you can solve this dispute. When did Congress become a problem? Because I'm, I'm trying to not leave well, my note. No, did my, you hear our leading with this, Mr. Pope? <laughs> did did you hear the conversation up. leading into um, – you just walked into something. So let me frame it a little <laughs> better because stepping the, into something. The, the good attorney wants you to answer this question. My, my response or what my comment was is Trump seems to be – going at this alone and i feel because congress has been a problem congress um for years um i think there's been an understanding that china has been a problem uh the policies have been a problem i don't know that they've been really calling china a manipulator currency manipulator but certainly trump did it on the trail and he's been consistent with that now uh the good attorney wants to know when did congress become a problem i think what he's getting at is congress has always been uh, it's, this is nothing new for Congress to have a low approval rating because it looks like they don't do anything. But we're talking about President Trump and his uh, stance on China. W- what do you think about that? Yeah, I agree with you. Uh, President Trump is a disruptor. And if he ran on a platform that he would be different than any politician, Republican or Democrat. And there has been a shift over the past, I would say, four years, the last downturn hurt the world, and it created very deep scars. So the election of Trump is a reflection of the world itself embracing nationalism, not not just here in the United States. Oh, nationalism, that's a term. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. Um, So you have Boris Johnson in the U.K. He's going to break... England away from the EU, Brexit. You have um, the French leader who was, who's president. He has a nationalist platform. Uh, Italy has, has government in place that's more nationalist. So those are just examples of other disruptive leaders similar to Trump. So Trump, he ran the platform that he was going to be disruptive. He was going to help the working person have a job. And, and, let, and let me jump in there because, you know, it's all in how President Trump packages and how he frames it. Had he led in and framed it like that, you know, I'm going to be a disruptor instead of saying things that were just uh, they were disruptive in nature, just how he says them. Uh, I think that would be 
it, things will go a bit better for him. He could get buy-in. I think he can form a better guiding coalition if he framed things differently. But I get his intention. So I'm sorry. I just had to say that for the, the attorney because he's and making I notes. Thought, but, but I thought he said that. I thought he said, I'm going to drain the swamp. Well, that's not saying I'm, what I'm saying. If he had said things that are, I think, in a more uh, business environment, and this is things, you know, th- being a disruptor, using that term, but using yeah, it in the right. business sense that doesn't scare businesses. And that, I don't think I don't businesses think are scared scare business. I don't think so. Scares think he the average, um, I don't know, maybe just the average American who's listening and who may be fearful because of what they're hearing. All, all the demagoguing right. that they hear across um, the, the airwaves. And then Trump says things that just aren't polished. They're just not politically but that's okay. correct. But, but, you know, that's OK for the people like, you, you know, who are very intellectual and, mm-hmm. and, and, and you know, they look at things in a very, you know, cerebral way. But I thought that what he did in the campaign was extremely effective. Oh, it's and effective. I, and that's what you that's the first step is when you when I think about Trump and my advice I'd be is don't change it. It worked. <laughs> you know, don't change what you did. It worked. Now the question is, will it work again? We'll leave that. But but Daryl, well, one of the things that, that we were just touching on is I and I was we were talking about this the the, the interaction with China. It would appear that Trump has a go it alone methodology here. He's not He's not put together any kind of backing with Congress, any kind of proposed legislation, any showing to China, listen, you're not just dealing with me. This is America's position that we're taking. And I think that may have gotten China to take the position. Okay, great. Then if it's just you, Mr. Trump, we're going to strategize getting around you. What are your thoughts about that, Daryl? You have an interesting perspective. And the Chinese, let's look at it from a couple of ways. America's history. America has dealt with China in a way where we haven't shown strength. Yeah, we haven't shown strength in the past. Trump is going along because he wants to keep his campaign promises. And then he has advisors who um, have different positions. So uh, Larry Cutlow, who used to be on CNBC, He's really a global trader. He wants to find a happy medium. But then you have this pilot, you have a uh, former professor at Cal, his name is Peter Navarro. He is an extremist. He hates China. Uh, Robert Reitenhauser has a reputation of a China hawk. He hates China. Um, Then you have Mnuchin, who's a free trader. He wants to find a compromise. And if you look at the history of Congress, they fought Obama on many issues that could have made life better for all Americans. And the Chinese know this. They're very in tune to uh, what goes on in our political system. A lot of um, people who work in high levels in China have U.S. educated uh, people. You know, you have... On their negotiating board, you've got people who have, have attended Harvard, and their children have attended school in the U.S. They know us very well. They know our methods. And Trump is going alone because he knows, not only on the China issue, but on the border wall and immigration, he knows that he's going to be he's going to make resistance from Democrats mainly. <laughs> well, well, let me. So say, he, but what about this, though? Let me throw this in because you mentioned that and. I believe right now Trump is the most powerful politician in America, not because he holds the office of president, but he's demonstrated he will play hardball and he will destroy Republicans who oppose him. So I I just feel like he has the position that he could at least bully statements that were very supportive of his position, but you hear nothing coming from the Republican uh, you know, Senate or Mitch McConnell, any way in any way, should, giving giving the impression that they're they're going to back him, even if they long term won't. You know, it's kind of symbolic, but I think that may have affected China, and so I guess that gets us to our next deal. I, I guess question for you, Daryl, and that would be a rate related to the the actual impact of the tariffs and and whether they're being effective, not effective, and maybe a little bit of a prediction. What what are your thoughts about the, the tariffs and whether they're being effective and how they're impacting our economy? They're not, from a U.S. perspective, they're not uh, effective. The 
the U.S. consumer will pay an additional $350 a month for, uh, let's say, uh, retail products as well as, uh, and you count retail and you count electronics. Those prices are going up no matter what. So as an example, my company, we're a, a, a multinational company. We're headquartered in Toronto, Celestia Corporation. Mm. We prepared for the tariffs last year. Uh, we had, The first phase of tariffs, we tried to absorb ourselves because we had to pay more for raw materials and components that we buy from our suppliers. The OEMs, we tried to pass on those price increases to them. Some of those were accepted. Some of those were not. And we have a, uh, a strategy now of optimizing accounts. So let's say if an IBM will not meet us in the middle on tariffs and price increases, we have a strategy of uh, just disengaging from that account. So everyone's handling it different. Right. Uh, supply chains have been moved. Um, in our case, we shut down a plant in China and moved it to Laos. All Three right, we're there. Ago. Okay. But yeah. thanks for calling Three in there. Ago. Thanks for calling yeah, in. We're, we're coming up on a break. Um, if you want, you can hold over. As a matter of fact, we, we'd love for you to hold over. Okay. Well, hold the line there. We're going to go to a quick break. Um, you know, get get some water because uh, the attorney made some notes. Get you a little drink and uh, come back. We'll My see you after the break. Right. <laughs> I'm enjoying it. So I'll just get you. Right back. Okay. I'm Donald L. Dowrish Jr., your motivational guru. This is the DLD Motivational Moment. You got up this morning. You got up this morning. Eyes sneaking open as the feet hit the floor. Got to thank God for the rise this day. The stove perking the smell of nutrition. Get to your destination with planned unselfish acts. Bulletin board read, do you have any to spare? Happiness and understanding. We all have experienced that one phone call, family member, co-worker, friend has passed on. We don't know our last evening or morning. Get up. Help someone out. Now walk it out. You got up this morning. This has been the DLD Motivational Moment. You can reach out to DLD at DLD28002 at yahoo.com or 813-394-5875. Hey, this is Agent Wright, better known as Mr. Clean. You looking for some great barbecues? Come see them two brothers in the grill, located at 423 Virginia Street, Charleston, West Virginia. We got ribs, chicken, pulled pork, brisket, collard greens, mac and cheese, baby. Come get some. And get you a nice, smooth cigar. 304-550-4431. That is 304-550-4431. Come get some, baby. The rib man, mama, the rib man. When it comes to reality radio, Everyone is a star. Shining star for you to see what your life can truly be. On your smooth soul and R&B station. On the World Wide Web. In Touch Radio. Okay, we're back. Let me give that call in number, 813-444-9588. So hopefully we still have Daryl on the line. You're there? Yes, sir. I'm here. Okay. So um, the good attorney, uh, you know, he liked what you were saying. And before I let you uh, back in, you know, I made a note, um, something that uh, obviously I don't know what site I got this from. But um, to your point, in 2018, uh, China had or they import 42 percent of apparel, 69 percent of footwear. Uh, and they don't get the percentage on electronics, um, but certainly that's a big part of their economy. And what gives credence to why Trump wanted to uh, label them as a currency manipulator is because that helps them if they manipulate their their currency. It certainly helps them because uh, it weakens their currency and, the, and it helps them to uh, increase prices on imports 
Or right. exports. Export. They, right. Yeah. Well, does it, it, it does, oh, does it make their goods cheaper to buy these raw materials that Daryl's talking about? Daryl, can you explain that to us? Yeah. What impact yeah. does this manipulation of the currency, uh, how, how, does it, how does it impact the tariffs? Correct. So it really offsets the tariffs. Mm. The Chinese goods are more competitive. So what the Chinese are saying is that, okay, Mr. Trump, you're applying a 20% tax on our goods. We're going to devalue our currency to the point where that 20% is offset and people will still buy from us for that reason. Right. So, 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 what a, buy, right. so, mm-hmm. so would a smart person then from Australia say, listen, I'm going to buy this stuff from China because we don't have tariffs on it. And I'm going to, because it's cheaper. Right. And then I'm going to resell it to you folks in America. Where there are no tariffs on it, but would would that be something that starts to emerge, or would you see a, a more what you indicated that people will just move their production over to uh, India or somewhere else in Asia? Yes. Yeah, so to answer your question, there is a strategy of um, let's say still buying from China, and China would ship to another country, Third party, and they would hold the goods as a distributor. And then they would ship it to America. So that's one strategy. That's one way to handle it. But ideally, a smart, let's say, global supply chain manager, what they want to do is you want to set up your supply chain, have a certain percentage of manufacturing to where you, your service in that market. So the whole reason that the U.S. went in so big with China really was to, let's say, expand the market for cell phones because they had no cell, they had no towers. So you know how we had overline, overhead lines back in the day for right. phones? Right. When, when cell phones came out, that was viewed globally as, hey, we're going to solve a problem for this mass market. And that's why companies like Motorola, they ran to China and set up manufacturing there, and they force suppliers to move there. An ideal scenario, and what our business has started to move to, is I'm saying that 33% of new opportunities are Asia-based, Southeast Asia, and China are becoming equal in the percentage of business. So if we want, if we have an OEM who's based in China, we want to set up the majority, of, and we're serving the Chinese market, the majority of our supply chain will be in China, except for commodities where it's not a strength of the supply base. Let, let me ask so, you this also, mm-hmm. it, and that is related yeah. to the the end game. And, and you know, I, you know I, I just have, you know, immense issues with a lot of what Donald Trump does in general because – uh, I just I can't you know and and maybe that's a good strategy for him, and that is I can't figure out or or, or predict out kind of where it's going where it's going to end because he double speaks and crosses over so many different things. Do you believe that the, the this route of using tariffs of, against China will be effective in ultimately getting them to address the seven issues I think that have been highlighted that they're doing with not just currency manipulation but uh, uh, theft, theft tech, stealing technology, mm-hmm. some of the other cyber stuff. All, all, and I don't know all the lists offhand. I can look it up. There are seven complaints that we've lodged and could not get anywhere on. And Trump comes in and said, you know what? We're going to go hardball. Do you think the terrorists are going to be effective in getting China to change its bad behavior? China, the, the terrorists are not effective to have China change its bad behavior. China is a communist government, they will, but they will never change to the degree that we like for IP protection. Uh, they've always done it, and it's hard to enforce. We're not going to win that one. I you say that IT I protections? Really, right. The, the yeah, level IT that we want, because they, right. want, they, want, they, they require mm-hmm. companies to share information. Right. So, so exactly. you set up a company, part of your setup includes <laughs> government access to whatever they want to find right, out. Right, right. And that's the political risk of, of all um, you know, companies that do business internationally. Right. And then the second point is uh, opening up opportunities to U.S. Uh, businesses. 
So we will, there will always be protectionists and they will, let's say in the case like Google. So Google will never be able to do business in China because you have a competitor named Baidu, B-A-I-D-U. Mm -hmm. That's the only internet service in China. Uh, you can't use Google in China. Right. So they will, the U.S. will not, will not win those two points. Our biggest opportunity is to close the gap in terms of uh, trade, where China will buy more agricultural goods from the U.S. and let's say purchase some uh, high-tech semiconductors mm. because we have a technology advantage. They're willing to, to badge on that. The real key point that we really want to win from... And then I want you to give me your, your forecast. After, after you make cool. this point, then give me your forecast. Right. So we would like the Chinese government to stop blocking key mergers such as uh, Broadcom and NVIDIA. Okay. That was a big merger that they blocked. Uh, and now my forecast is that this trade site will linger on for at least two more years. Oh, my goodness. That's very minimal. Yeah. Uh, they've got both sides have dug in. It's going to linger for two years. Mm. Well, we appreciate you calling in there. Absolutely. Giving us a lot of things to think about. Listen, I hope you continue to listen to the show. Also, anytime that you're listening, you hear us talking about something that we need some some guidance on, feel free. Because uh, we're, 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 we're not unlike the Israelites lost in the wilderness. <laughs> we just walk, we're walking alone. If you can give us some, some, some kind of mosaic leadership, we appreciate it. Thank you very much for taking time with us this morning, Darren. All right. You guys are most welcome. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Man, he threw a lot out there. He did. He did. I was actually looking up that uh, I couldn't remember what it was, but it's the 5G that uh, he way, whatever you, however you pronounce it. And that's one of the things I think China has a huge advantage over us on is its ability to plan for the future in multiple years. And and those that gets me back to some of my, my issues with, with, with this go it alone approach that he's got. No one else is vested in his being successful. They will benefit from it if they mm -hmm. are allowed to. But I mean, Here's one of the things in America. We talked about that Baltimore thing. Mm -hmm. Rich people remain rich because they're going to adjust easily to whatever the circumstances are to profit from that what it is. Okay, That's the same thing on the international stage. Companies, okay, really, China? Tariffs? We'll go here. We'll do that. Third party. Let's keep it moving. They're going to make money. So it's really difficult, I think. And I know that we have a history of trying to use economic factors to influence behavior with Cuba, and they're nowhere near as strong as China. That's why I think it's folly to use that mechanism and definitely to go it alone as he has uh, in, in this fashion, which I think goes back to this, it's just the fact that he's just un, he, he's, he's an actor. I don't think he's a leader. Well, now, am I out on the limb here if, and I'm going to pull in what's going on in Hong Kong. Okay. So if they're protesting because, you know, they, they want to be able to uh, have say in their uh, representation, um, what if that were to happen right there in China? Well, first you need to spare. People don't protest when they're doing well. well and yeah. the Chinese people are doing, compared to how they were doing before, mm -hmm. their, their quality of life has continually progressed and improved. See, Hong Kong is different. See, right. Hong Kong is more of an international city. You've got a hub and a mixture of a lot of different things. Uh, you got idealists and things that, that people have a view of, of what life should be like for them. Very different than, I think, the rank-and-file mainland China uh, worker has. Right, but mainland China, it, I mean, they, they have to bow to their government. My, my, my point here is if some of the forecasts, because I know it's not on the liberal side, but so on the conservative side of the house where they're saying China can't afford to really go this very long now, Certainly. When you say there. let that let these protests continue, uh, no, 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 not. I'm talking about or the tariffs. Tariffs. They they can't afford to really go this way now. I guess, and I don't know much about their market, so I'm I'm really repeating what I heard. But it made sense. They talk about their um, what is the swine flu that affected their their animal farms. The, the, so the chicken, and, right? And so all, yeah, all that kind of stuff. So really, that that already happened, and why while they have the way their government is structured, so they have a bit of a leverage over their average citizen. Um, but at some point, if their economy continues 
uh, to suffer in any way because of these tariffs. I mean, I, I, I don't think it's far-fetched to think that that couldn't happen in China. I think absolutely. The Chinese person thinks differently. And, you know, they're conditioned to accept life as it is. Not, they don't have this utopic uh, uh, Western view of perfection, of mm-hmm. life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness and all that good stuff. I mean, we, we get back into why, why they didn't want slaves and African-Americans educated you know, you know, doing reconstruction because now you figure out what you could be. So I think the rank and file Chinese person, I don't think, is open to that. Um, everybody understands that revolution and change sometimes gets really ugly. Mm. And you know what? I what I got, I know I have. I might just tolerate that. But let's come back to that when we get back. We're gonna talk about some other things. Listen. Yeah, you know what? I got my shirt on coming oh, to America. So boy. let's talk about this thing. <laughs> the, the, the remake. <laughs> Ah, yes, it's going to be remade. All right, we're going to take a quick break, pay some bills. You're listening to Touch News Radio. Reality Radio, where everybody can be a star. We'll be right back. Uh, yeah, you. My name is Gil Sampson. I didn't come from a very rich family, and so paying for college would have been very tough. I don't know if I would have been able to go to the college that I went to, and then I don't know if I would have gotten into the career that I am in. So I think Bright Futures has done a lot to shape my life. I got a job as a structural engineer, and I design residential buildings, commercial buildings all over the United States. Because of Bright Futures, I was able to go to college. You know, so many kids just don't even ever get that opportunity. And to be able to do it and not have any debt when I graduated is amazing. And it was all thanks to Bright Futures. Florida has created more than one million jobs in only five years. And a great education connects our students to these exciting opportunities. That's why the Florida Lottery has funded Bright Futures scholarships to help over 725,000 students attend college. Because every play is for education. The Florida Lottery. Just imagine. Hi, this is Dale Day. Join me every Monday at 7 p.m. for Jazz at Miss Connie's House, bringing you the smoothest jazz and the coolest guests right here on In Touch Radio. You're listening to In Touch Radio. All right, we're back. And listen, if you couldn't see that on on our YouTube, our engineer Esteban, with a big finger that he gave me, bringing me back in live. Glad to be back. Like you're listening to News Radio, Reality Radio. My name is Clinton Paris. Uh, I, I, I sit to the left because I, I lean to the left and on my right in the red shirt. Yes, sir. Professor uh, Tony And I Seabrook, certainly lean know. right, baby. Just want to congratulate you and all the educators back in school, you know, uh, yeah. educating our youth. I mean, I, the enlightenment of the mind, I think, is one of the most powerful things we can do in America. So I commend you and all the teachers out there. Uh, you know, we, we understand the difficulty that you have. We know those kids because they're our kids. And we just want to thank you all for the work you do uh, trying to educate them and give them the chance to be all they can be. want to do two quick, 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 quick commercials. The first one is, listen, today is – the day of the Tampa Alumni Chapter Guide Right Foundation is holding its black and white ball uh, at Pepin Center. Uh, it's going to be a great gala affair. You know, everybody will be dressed in the best and coming out. And we should we look forward to having a very, very exciting uh, time tonight. So if you're you're one of the people in the area, uh, please consider joining us at that event. It's a really, really fun event. Uh, another event I want to highlight, just, just remind you all, is, is the upcoming 10th annual Power Couples Ball. Uh, as you all may know, this is sponsored by In Touch News in particular. It was created by Daryl and, and Tammy uh, Johnson, uh, the owners of In Touch News. Uh, this is a great event. It's all about love. 
Uh, it's about the power of couples, uh, not individually, meaning that you're powerful in yourself and what you do, but the power of a couple, two people putting their lives together, leverage, leveraging their talents and commitment to make them greater uh, than they are otherwise and able to influence not only their family, but their community. But the Power Couples Ball, it is Saturday, September 21st of 2019. It will be held at the Grand Hyatt uh, in Tampa, Florida. Cocktails at 6.30, dinner at 7.30. Uh, listen, come on out. Think about, about going to InTouch News and getting a table at this event. It's very reasonable. Table is only $1,000, but if you're buying individual tickets, individual tickets are $125. Now, I know you're thinking, wow, that may be a little bit pricey. Really, no, it's not. Because uh, for, for you fellas out there, listen, you may be like me. You've been in that relationship for a while, and you've run out of ideas. You need to make a firm statement to your wife and significant other of the power of your love. Think of no better way than getting her dressed up in a beautiful nightgown, bringing her out, and participating in the reaffirmation of love uh, process that we do. There's a moment in the entire event where, where all the couples stand face-to-face -face with their loved ones and profess their love and commitment to doing what they can to, to make that relationship as strong as possible. So the Power Couples Ball is a great event. And would you believe it or not, we actually party. There's a live band that plays, uh, and then there's a DJ. But the proceeds go to, 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 to support scholarships and education, and it really is a great event. Uh, for more information, please go to intouchnews.com. Uh, look at the, the information contained there. But really think about coming out and supporting the event. Uh, for you businesses, tables are a great idea for your clients to show them that what you think about them uh, and what they can, you know, what they mean to you. But for me, as we've always attended, my wife and I, and we've always had a great time bonding with the other couples and just taking a minute away from the kids and the job and the dog and, and the dishes to really relook at ourselves and just talk about being in love because I think it's one of the most powerful things you can have in addition to a pocket full of money. So if you're in love with someone, please consider Power Couples Ball September 21st, 2019 at the Grand Hyatt here in Tampa. Okay, those are my commercials. Did my duty. I've got that out the way. Now let's get back talking about this economy because I Trump's entire presidency i think hinges on the economy would you agree with that professor or not i would agree with that and not that it, and that would his re-election hinge on a good economy well you know you like to say that presidents aren't aren't elected on um a good economy they're just unelected on a bad economy exactly right and and what he has right now is a good economy i mean you can throw in the the tariffs you can take him out you can talk about this right uh, what's happening with the european um i, I hear they're talking about doing a um uh, and they're not doing a rate cut. What are they doing? They're doing a. Um, I think they're gonna have to do a rate cut. I think the rate cut they're doing. I, I think they have to. Okay. There's no. They've gotta um, because right now if they don't do a rate cut, no one's gonna borrow money from them. So money's not coming into the country. They can use right. to expand their their money supply. But on that point, we are entering into. I think if we have another uh, uh, economic growth this quarter, we will have had the longest growth of American economy in history. And we can thank President Obama for what? eight straight years whoa, of economic whoa, whoa. For eight straight years of economic growth with no threat of a downturn. Trump has gotten about two of that. So he gets so so Obama gets credit for eight years of growth and Trump gets credit for two. And hope goodness. I hope he can keep it going because we need the economy to remain strong. And I think if he My take a goodness. more collaborative approach I think that eight I, years. I think you got some comments you want to make it, but go ahead. If you don't, you, I mean, I just go by the stats. I just don't understand just the stat. The stat. I'm just I, go by the numbers. I, I just don't understand the, how, the, in the one numbers? breath, the Democrats go. He's trying to undo everything that President Trump, I mean President Obama, has done. And if that were the case, then we wouldn't have a good economy. So he's not undoing everything that Obama did. And I guess I, I, I mean, whoa, whoa, let's back up. Do you disagree that we had eight years of economic growth under Obama? Well, if we didn't, okay, and that Trump has had two. Uh, Those are facts. And poor Esteban is conflicted <laughs> over here, watching but, you try not to answer. He, he, what here's why I'm stumbling here because I, I can't say we we didn't have growth because we were in a. It's okay to uh, say we were it. in an economic downturn, in a recession, it's, it's okay coming to, out of one. It's okay to say it. So we could only go up. 
So, I, and I'm I'm really struggling. No, no, you could have gotten, you could have went further down. I mean, Bush well, kept he, us going he did, down. He did a stimulus. No, well, Bush didn't do a stimulus. So President Obama did a stimulus package, and and, and it it was effective. Um, but and I, I Trump just, and Trump did a stimulus package, and it was effective. Yeah, but it, oh, okay. it's different when he does. Well. Well, I'm, yeah. I'm just, I'm just no, I'm, okay, I don't know. Okay, so let me answer the question so it doesn't seem like I'm being that partisan. So, yeah, we, 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 we did have that growth. partisan. Listen, listen, we did Clarence have Thomas under. is looking at you going, How far right are you going to go? <laughs> <laughs> He's got, you got Scalia and Trump and, and Thomas got their hands up in the air. Oh, my going, goodness. So, yeah, how far? So I've, I've conceded that. I mean, I, you know, so yeah, we, we did have growth under. Uh, President Obama, and and I and, and the feeling that a lot of people get is you know presidents don't get they don't do that. I think they do set the tenor, and Donald Trump has done a great job of setting a business friendly tenor that we're gonna do things. Now the reality of that is if it's business friendly, that usually means it's not good for the customer. But that's okay because you know you have to find the balance in that. But I was I mentioned that to to the economy piece because we're having signs that the economy is is cooling, mm. is is slowing and is that a concern that Republicans should have going into this election and the down ballot. Well, it is a concern that they should have because I don't think they did a very good job of really trumpeting um, before we got to the tariffs. I don't think Republicans as a whole, especially Congress, I don't think they well yeah, I don't think they did as good of a job as they could have done, uh, taking every opportunity to say how well the economy is. But, I mean, they had things that but they had to Trump, contend with. But would, would, would Trump let them, though? He takes up so much oxygen, he doesn't give anybody else any room to, you know, he won't even – I mean, think about this guy. He's so consumed with every moment being about him, he won't even have a pre- let his press secretary have a press conference. He, well, he took that poor person's time, too. Well, here's the thing. Now, do you really blame him because because of his personality, because of who he is and, and right, wrong, or indifferent, how he carries himself? It's just his press conferences aren't like Obama's press conferences. He's already offended half the people in the room. So he, he's Obama, leaving. Obama did no different. Half the people in the room were offended with him, too. Only the Republicans. It, it, it half if half were Republicans because the liberal media and the media itself loved right. President Obama. The Got only okay. the only outlet that didn't love him was Fox. So not going to give you that. Wouldn't half the room. Maybe, maybe. Yeah. Well, I, 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 okay, room. okay, got it. So, so, um, but yeah, I, it, he's shell shocked. I mean, his own uh, news conferences have gone against him. Jim, what Jim Acosta, whatever his last name. I mean, this guy's going to pop up and try to get it going, try to ask him a question, put him on the spot. Create some news, make himself right. the story, uh, not the information. And then there's another one. I, I don't know her name, but they're they're in there ready to lob a grenade just to get this thing going because they know it didn't take much for him to become unhinged and send a tweet. And then we have another storyline that we have to follow for the rest of the week. But So so I, I blame Trump for the situation. I, I, I blame his leadership style, the his, 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 his I call it cavernous, an empty personality which forces him to to uh, take up, like I said, all the oxygen wherever it may be. But does that now? Because if Trump goes down, there's going to be a there's nothing left of the Republican Party. He has gutted it of its principles that there's no place anybody can go stand and say, okay, uh, that's unfortunate for him. We're left here to fight. Cause like when Obama left the stage, I think Nancy Pelosi and Schumer have done a great job holding the fort, pending the next round. That you know they did a great job, even when they had the minority in both houses. She did a great job and got back to the to the forefront. Now, because What's you guys ha- didn't have a disruptor, but President Obama wasn't a disruptor. He was very much part of what we call. The political system. He was no different. He was a lawyer. He came in. He said things that on the campaign trail that he didn't do when he got in office. So he was definitely one of them. Now we have someone who was a Democrat for a number of years, changed over to become a Republican. It is a is a businessman through and through. And now he's a politician. And you want people to think he he represents the Republicans. No, he, he is a Republican president. But he doesn't represent Republicans, you know? He think? does not represent Republicans. I was a Republican before him, and when people say, well, how can you support Trump? 
Because he's the president, that's why I support Trump. But I was a Republican you, what, before him. I was a Republican when support, Obama was in office. But, but did you support Obama as president? I voted for Obama the but first time. did you time. support Obama as president? I support my president. I'm ex-military. Right. Yeah, I, you're I, right. I, exactly. Yeah, I, you know, I've never had to, you know, have that requirement that they shoot me if I don't follow along. So, no, it wasn't that. But you know. I believe, I believe in yeah. a chain of command. I, uh, you're right. That's all. I mean, to me, I think that flies in the face of democracy. But my my big concern right now for the Demo for the Republicans are, if the economy goes bad, do you think that that Trump's in trouble? I I think he could be, unless he goes hard on the race issue. You know what, Trump? Trump is prepared to go as hard as he he's always ready to get in the gutter. So he's the one person that probably will come out of it. He'll come out the same way he went in. Oh, no, I have no doubt. No, no, no. And if that means I need to go back to being a Democrat or independent or Martian, he'll convert. <laughs> he'll convert. Uh, uh, he'll convert no. that. Listen, I hear the music. Guess what that means? No, it doesn't. Because guess what? We're going over. How about that? It doesn't mean we're going off. Listen, if you're watching us on In Touch News Radio uh, to YouTube or listening, we have a bonus half hour. Yeah. I want to talk about this thing going on with. Israel denying duly elected people of Congress to come uh, into yeah, an, I airport, love it. an airport that we pay our tax dollars to, to fund. I love so we're going to come back and talk a little bit more for an extra half hour. Stay with us. We're going to be on the air until 1130 this morning. This is Clint Paris, In Touch News Radio, Reality Radio, where everybody can be a star. We'll be right back. Junior, your motivational guru. This is the DLD Motivational Moment. One darn second. America since 2017 is suffering from a serious hiccup. 9-11 is seriously overused in a distasteful manner. Every day the cops are calling on an innocent, innocent person of color. It amazes me that America has come down to this. A person of color becomes a person of interest. Waffle House, the dorm, Starbucks is a few. This is not the lunch counters, sit-ins of the 1960s. 2019, harassed simply for being black and proud. Hold on one darn second. This has been the DLD Motivational Moment. Pre-order my new book, Motivational Moments, at DLD28-2002 at yahoo.com or 813-394-5875. Hi, this is Dr. Veronica Walters, also known as Dr. V, the head of school at the Walters Academy for Entrepreneurship, a place that we like to call The Way, where we're educating today's youthpreneurs to be tomorrow's billionaires through social entrepreneurship. Do you have a student who's bored, frustrated, gifted, inquisitive, creative, business-minded? Then maybe you need to check The Way out. Listen, we have an educational platform that allows for individualized instruction. It's strength-based project-based, and designed to help your students become the absolute best they can while starting their own business and being an entrepreneur. If you're looking for something different and you need to find a more excellent way, then you need to visit us at The Way. That's The Way, www.thewaetampa.org. Or you can call us at 813-603-7923. We look forward to showing your students a more excellent way at The Way. Talking to you about all things political, economic, education in America, wherever you may be, um, and issues concerning uh, you and, and your family and what may be going on in your community. We welcome you to join into the discussion. This is straight up the middle, our bonus hour. It's a call in show. You can call us at 813 444 9588. 813 444 9588. Listen, oftentimes we get. I thought you said the second one. The second right. one I thought you said. 9588. 
Yeah, four 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 nine five eight 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 four four. Anyway, so oftentimes we get to the end of discussion and then it takes another thirty minutes or forty five minutes to get out the parking lot because we're still talking. So this morning we're gonna do that on the air with you. I've got my co-host Professor Tony Seabrook with me here in studio. Mm. We actually wrote, we th- thank Daryl again for calling in, kind of giving us an explanation from an international perspective on the tariffs and how they're impacting businesses, and he gave some predictions. Um, Two years, man. Wow, that's yeah. Dead. I think I don't. I think sooner than that. I think uh, whoever I comes so. in after Trump. Or after the election, which that's about two years, isn't it? No, no. not next year. No, that when, as soon as that election, there's no over, one coming in after Trump. As soon as the election's over, I think that will get itself resolved. I'm not saying we'll go back to where we were, but um, I just don't think the Democrats are going to work. Even if, if whatever he cut, deal he cuts, it, it's going to. She can't get it by Congress. They're not going to give him anything. I don't think. Um, but as long as he's going in alone, he's going to have some buy-in on the front end. But let's get this second. I want to talk yeah. about. What happened last week with this visit to um, Israel. Uh, Israel by uh, Representative, is it Omar? Omar Ilhan Omar and, and uh, uh, Rashida Tlaib. Tlaib. A couple of things. So, so, there, so there is a, a, a well-established record of them having issues with things that have happened in Israel. And I guess my first thing would be, when did it become uh, un-American to criticize Israel? That's that's the first thing we have to figure out okay. because I think that leads to re- when did that happen? Well, it, it's never been really accepted as okay. We know as Americans we have that's part of what we have. We have the right to speak our mind. We have the First Amendment, but and especially congressional members, the only reason that it's not fully condemned now is because we have such a liberal Democrat party now. But other than that, if these are regular Americans, yeah, everyday citizens, yeah, you have your opinion, and you even have your opinion as congressional members. But there's such thing, there are limits, there's decorum, and these two, I, I don't know, these two are special. Okay. These two make a living of being controversial. And the whole BDS movement, they want to censor. Uh, would it be that they're because of the disruptors? No, they're not disruptors. No, <laughs> really, they're no. not disruptors. No, 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 they're just controversial. They're, they're, I don't, I don't see them as disruptors at all, because um, we've seen politicians like them. Yeah, they, they just um, Greystone, what Gray, whatever the the guy here in Florida. I mean, he he was the same way. I mean, just known for saying things that are not popular. He's just trying to get a certain base or just to get his name out there. But these two are special. And then if you throw in AOC, you really got you something. But I don't blame Israel at all. As a matter of fact, I didn't even know that they had walked it back until I saw the story of now um, Representative uh, Tlaib decided she wouldn't go. Uh, she didn't want the invitation after they rescinded. Um, right. And right. invited her. So it was a publicity stunt. So now I'm angry. But why would Israel let let them use them that way? I mean, the whole idea is... A couple of things. Let me back up. So there was a delegation that went over to Israel, a congressional delegation, mm-hmm. about a month or so Before back. Before them, like right. 70 of them, right, I believe. Right. Yeah. They, the, there was there were requests that there be certain things added to the visit related to the West Bank, how the West Bank is being handled, related to the Palestinian situation. And there was pressures. There was, they were putting pressure saying, listen, let's give both sides adequate time to inform us, meaning Congress needs to know what is happening with the Palestinians as well as what's happening with Israel. And it was kind of decided, nah, that might be too controversial because here's my gut feeling. It's kind of like the reason uh, Trump may not have really wanted cameras inside the detention centers. If people actually see what's happening in the West Bank, it's kind of like going into that, that Baltimore community. You, your, your conscience demands something be done about this. Right. You can't look at it and say, oh, okay, well, let's we'll see how this thing is going. It demands something be done. Not that one side is right versus the other side, but when you look at the level of oppression and despair, and the word that they use is occupation because of right. the presence of, of Israeli military physically exactly. in the area. Mm-hmm. That's, that's, you know, people argue about whether it's occupation or not. But when you see it, it demands that something be done about it to bring it to, to a, some kind of decision. That was what the push was. 
that was not received well because of it, this position with Israel took. No, no, no. We won't have any part of any of that. Right. You come here, you get, go back home. We're so, sovereign nation. Right. So the, so so these two duly elected people from Congress mm -hmm. said, fine. They're duly elected in the United States. Yeah, right, right. So stay me for a minute. Mm -hmm. We're going to fly into the airport that you get money from us to maintain and secure. Mm -hmm. And we're going to you know, go around into the areas and see, one, how you're using our money. Mm -hmm. And actually how you're using our money against these people as well. Because you can't do this if America doesn't give Israel the amount of welfare that we give it. Mm -hmm. we, they get our, our, our probably more money than any other country from us. And they're using that money to control the West Bank and the other areas of Palestine and deal with that issue. That's what they were pushing to bring highlight to that. Now, th I think the, the Trump in his effort mm -hmm. – and desire to make these two ladies more important than they really are. And I take from their history why they're, it's more matters to them. One of them is, I think, is, is Palestinian, if I'm not correct. She's a descendant. Exactly. Right, exactly. So she's very, this is no different than some African Americans who, when they got elected, when they came in, they came in like, listen, I come here with some real problems back at home. That y'all really are not talking about, don't know about, mm -hmm. and and my constituents gonna hold me accountable for that, and, and so that's one of the dynamics I think. Their perspective, they come in, I think, with a different level of commitment and desire to raise this issue and make something happen. That that's the one dynamic of well, that I think is a big part of it. You that. present that as if these two, or even uh, just Representative uh, Talib. Because she's one of Palestinian, right? To leave. <coughs> Excuse me. As if she hasn't made statements that were controversial, hadn't taken positions. So I understand what you're saying, but I'm I'm totally okay with them denying that entry. And I just I hate that they walked it back. We had the president of Iran come to America, go on tour, and make speeches. America did. You know why? We're a democracy, mm -hmm. and we have no issue with you speaking your mind and say we have to say. The risky thing is not hearing dissent. So the fact that these ladies may be crit critical, the only other comment Israel can say is we're perfect. We're above. We're above criticism. Well, we're above. We're above you criticizing us. We're above you challenging what we're doing well, because we're perfect, and then there's no space for it. Cause we could. It was only them two. You could have sent two that, others. I'm not saying who sends. They chose to lead this. We right. don't choose. You, that's what a beautiful thing about leaders. I don't mm -hmm. think leaders are chosen. I think leaders choose to lead. You don't pick somebody and say, hey, hey, Esteban, you're now a leader. Go lead. That's that's not the dynamic. And no one gets to choose. Who everybody takes a who leads, everybody who's in a uh, management position or even a CEO position is not a leader. Uh, so just because no. you choose. The words yeah. aren't really synonymous. No, no. The second part is leadership is when people then follow what you push or what you drive and go along with that. That's leadership. Right. You connect with people and it becomes a, a great. But let's go back to just that there. My, 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 my issue was Israel is really the, the closest democracy in that area mm -hmm. by not tolerating dissent. It weakens its position, I think. It, it, it's, a, it's an actual affront to why you why democracy exists. Democracy exists, Esteban, so that people that disagree can also have a say. Not so that we can say, no, you don't get to say anything, and you never get to, like in Hong Kong. These people, the, the, I'm, I'm stunned that they've let that go as long as they have because there's no mechanism, really, to give them what they're wanting because mm -hmm. you don't really have the power, mm -hmm. you, you know, I guess. And that's why they took over the airport. So that was my concern was it, it, it yelled to the rest of the world that doesn't believe in democracy, that those people that say they do don't either. That was my concern that that it said to any other despot around the country, Saudi Arabia, uh, Egypt, where they oppress dissent, mm. even the place that says they can tolerate people criticizing them. They can't, and this is an example of it. That's one part of it. What do you think? What do you think about that that line of, of logic? Um, they were already. I don't think it was about them criticizing Israel because they were doing that before. I think Israel's point was, you're not going to do it on our 
<laughs> why not? Why, why not though? We had we had the president of Iran mm-hmm. come to the United but States. But he wasn't. He didn't come here and criticize us. Yes, he. Uh, good Lord, he stood at the United Nations and said, "The devil is sitting over oh, there, Joe Obama." Okay. He called him the devil. Okay. Oh, he said oh, Satan was oh, at under, the, uh, Venezuela. Under other administration. Yeah, I'm just saying, okay. but we tolerate okay. this in America it. because of our commitment to democracy. That's part of the messaging of why we allow protests and and people to speak out because in, in, and I know the unfortunate thing is is this. There's a large part of the world that really questions whether or not the democratic countries are truly believing in democracy. And they use things like Jim Crow laws. They use things like apartheid. They use moments in history where democracy has failed the most vulnerable. When it didn't look, it only looked out to maintain mm. and feed itself. So that was my, that was my big issue mm. with with them turning it down, it made them look like they were weak because they, they were afraid of what might happen if these people came because and did what they were going to do. That I was, think they avoided thought. the optics of it. Oh, wow. We're going to come back to let's 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 pick up that. when We come back. You listen to the bonus a half hour of in touch news with straight up the middle. Uh, we will be right back after this quick break. Now we're going to get to the second part of that. Trina Johnson with Caldwell Banker Real Estate, the real estate agent you've been looking for. If you want top dollar for your home or you're looking to make a purchase, call me at 813-244-6953. Again, 813-244-6953 and let me list your home. This is Linda Archie with Tyler Temple United Methodist Church. Join us every first and third Saturday of the month at the Village Market East Tampa, 3206 North Sanchez Street. Free parking, free admission, fresh produce, live entertainment, vendor shopping, and delicious cooked food. Join us every first and third Saturday of the month, beginning June 22nd. For vendor information, call me, 1-888-991-2502. See our ad in In Touch News or Florida Sentinel. Please call me at 1-888-991-2502. The Village Market at East Tampa, 3206 North Sanchez Street. When it comes to reality radio, everyone is a star. Shining star for you to see what your life can truly be. On your smooth soul and R&B station. On the World Wide Web. In Touch Radio. Okay, we're back in touch radio, reality radio, where everyone's a star. Let me give you the call in number again in case you're listening. 813-444-9588. So we're back and we were talking about um, how Israel handled the two uh, representatives by denying their entry initially and then walking that back. But the two decided, uh, at least the one decided not to go. Uh, and that was uh, Representative uh, Rashida Tlaib. The good attorney would have me think that in that particular instance that Israel uh, showed weakness and that they're not a uh, true uh, representative of democracy. I totally agree with that. Um, and it may be because of my military background. I don't know what it is. Maybe because... I won't say that. But anyway, I, I agree with their position because it's not that they were denying them or somehow um, censoring their speech and they couldn't, uh, they didn't have a voice. It was more or less, you're not going to do it from our pulpit. So I'm not going to let you do that on our soil. That's how I took it. Um, the good attorney also talks about maybe uh, Netanyahu being somehow. Um, uh, what's the term? <laughs> I'm looking for the term. Beholden, not, not a puppet. Beholden. 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 Yeah, beholden to uh, President Trump. Now, here's how I would answer that or, or speak to that. I, I don't know what their relationship is like, but I know that um, he's been uh, 
very uh, complimenting of complimenting of uh, President Trump uh, when President Trump, the only president that uh, stuck to his word and moved the um, the embassy to Jerusalem, recognizing Jerusalem as the capital, that bought him favor differently than any other president. So uh, what's a call to let them back in to change my mind? So there's nothing wrong with that. As, as a sovereign country, um, I don't think, and, and, and really, you know, part of it from Trump's perspective, whether or not Israel lets them in or not, how does that impact or have an effect on Trump? Why is it any matter to him? Because they're also his rivals. Got it. And so he now internationally politicized what another country does. That's the risky part. Just imagine if America's foreign policy is dictated by the politics of inside Canada. American policy is already dictated by what's going on. By what's going on, but by the, not the internal politics. We don't make decisions about how we do what we're going to do in America to influence the politics in Canada. If the president has an issue in Canada with somebody mm -hmm. who's political rivals, because a rival one day becomes a counterpart the next day. You just say that Israel was our strongest ally. Now. Absolutely, without a doubt. Okay, so if they're our strongest ally in that region, then they would bond with us, and with us being the leadership of our country in what the leadership thought was appropriate at the time. Now, I'm not saying his actions were correct. What I'm saying is, if they're, that's just like being my best friend. It may not be the this best decision, the, it goes, but I'm your best friend. That, I'm has, a that has nothing to do with the autonomous functions of a country. And once a country starts, I, I know what happens in reality. We, I know all day long this really does happen. The problem is we've reduced it down to something so minor as a whether or not you allow another Congress. So it looks like Donald Trump's allegiance has a greater allegiance to the, his pol politics within Israel as opposed to an American citizen and a, and a sitting congressperson. Those are things that concern me greatly that he... Now, I'm not surprised that Donald Trump's that petty, though. I exactly. expect that. Though, I'm just stunned that another internet... Because I, I consider maybe Netanyahu a legitimate politician you know, on the world stage. I don't, I, I, Donald Trump to me is a clown. Mm. He's a clown who got elected by doing his, his um, uh, 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 New York con man show on the country. Oh. It happens. Man, you know, me, I'm just saying what it is though. I like, see. Somebody, like somebody said, if he wasn't born rich, he'd be selling fake watches on Broadway somewhere. But that's not what it, it is what it is. But, but, but when he engages these other, I think, People that get the seriousness of, of each individual decision, I'm stunned that somebody then in this matter will be complicit. You know, kind of like with Greenland. The other day he says, I'm looking at buying Greenland. Mm -hmm. Greenland simply says one thing. It's not for sale. Okay. They didn't get into anything else. They simply responded, it's not for sale. Now, do you know that that, that the whole purchase of Greenland has happened? Because you know Multiple times. I know that. Okay. I'm not saying that. But the way that he does it, is, it's not, it wasn't, you know, in, oh, it, it comes out what, of left what field. What did he do? It came out of left field. We have an economy. We have issues in America that we need to deal with. He's on the ah, looking at real estate. <laughs> <laughs> you know, when I first heard the story, yeah. I'm thinking. He's looking at real estate. That that would be a feather in his hat yeah, when he's out of office and go, you know, yeah. not only did I buy property, I bought green. I bought, I bought green. <laughs> well, we bought the, we bought Alaska. You know, we bought the Louisiana Purchase, so we yeah. bought property. But but that was the other part, getting to the Trump piece of the engagement of participating. Do you think this will have long-range implications no. on Trump? Not at all. <clears throat> Excuse me. Now, the Democrats are going to try to make it stick as if, you know, they stuck together and robbed the World Bank. I mean, that's that's how you guys are going to try to portray it. But it was one, a one-time thing. It was Trump saying it, it, it was, um, I like how Dara put it, China knows our, our ins and outs. I mean, they have people over here. Israel knows how we operate as well. Israel understands. Okay, they have the same, let's stay there then. Stay okay. there then. What about for Israel? You have, mm -hmm. Does Israel now have an issue long-term when it shows back out with its palm up looking for, for federal assistance? Only and, with a Democratic now, president. You, or what about a Democratic Congress? Yeah. Because you guys can now, be petty too. Exactly. Particularly when you, like Trump says, when you want our money. That's mm -hmm. the thing. I think if it was any American, 
based on the amount of money we give Israel, mm-hmm. you, you, you uh, unless it's an absolute, if they had framed this as an absolute national security risk that they needed to be dealt with in a very you know special way. But I, part of it, I think, is Trump is really and he's trying to do to elevate their status. Period. So any way he can, he, he is going to. Well, but let's yeah. look at this a different way. The United States is a Judeo-Christian nation. There, there, there's more than just politics tied to Israel. There, there's, um, there, there uh, I forgot about the, the biblical part of that. Um, so however you try to frame it in a political way, I think the history of what Israel means to the United States and what the United States mean to Israel, I don't think the politics will overcome that. So I don't care how you frame it, what's going to happen with the Democratic Congress or a Democratic president. We understand as a nation to this point the ties to Israel. And why we are so... And if, and if Israel doesn't adhere to it... See, this is the risk of the entire Palestinian issue. Israel is not addressing it in a, Christ, in, in a Judeo-Christian value process. I would agree. And that ultimately could... In, in the, the, this, this is one of those minor dynamics of it. They've got to be real careful if they fall back on that because other people look at it and go, well, but you're not acting consistent with that. But you're expecting us to treat you as if you're in this special uh, situation, particularly when you have other areas in the world that that will be demonstrating that people are, uh, you know, under incredible suffering. Now, listen, we're almost out of time. I got I, I got to let you get some shots in on the Democrats because I know I spend a lot of time in our discussion. Uh, first, let me get this out. So I heard a rumor, pure rumor, everybody. You find out yourself that Biden's camp is cutting back on his schedule. Good or bad, what do you think? I think it's strategic, and here's why. Biden had another gaffe, um, and, and I, I didn't save the story. Biden can be his worst enemy. Let me stop you right there. I want to on the flag this. Of course, this is a trap. I just want to put that out. I just want to put out. I hear the gate swinging down behind you, but go ahead. <laughs> Flag the so tank. That's the go if, ahead. If you um, limit his his appearances, okay, you, you also protect, um, you know, the records, if you will. Right. Um, Biden. Uh, I, I think what's happening. I'm trying to think back to the last debate. Cory Booker was was all over him. Mm-hmm. About right. his record, uh, his and, you know his record as it pertains, as it pertains to gun rights and those Uh-oh. things. Oh, we got a call. A last minute call. <laughs> okay, in touch radio. In touch radio. Uh, who do we have? Hello, who do we have on the line? He's a CEO on the line. I just want to say one thing about uh, Joe Biden. Uh oh. <laughs> Make it quick. We we don't have much time. Our yeah. upper management is gonna yeah. cut us off soon. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. And cut him off, too. Look, don't give him a second. Hey, <laughs> what I want to say about Joe Biden. Joe Biden, I think, is going to quit the race. Uh, I think he's going to be seeing Tom, Tom Steyer uh, uh, propel himself into the mix. That's my thought. See you later. Okay. Well, you know, that's interesting. I'm glad he said that because, you know, the irony of what was happening at least a month ago the party that, and I've said this before, the party that constantly berates old white men and the patriarchy had two old white men leading it, and that was Joe Biden, and, and then it was uh, Bernie Sanders. Now, what I did notice uh, a couple of days ago, who's raised the most money? Peter Buttigieg. Yeah, he can raise money. Don't, yeah. make, don't make me go into why, though. I'm going to leave that alone. Well, I, 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 believe, I believe it's the LGBT community behind it. There's See, a lot of money there. I'm not there. falling for that trap. See, I'm and not falling for that. There's a lot of money there. I'm not going and he would be the first uh, you know, openly gay president. I mean, there, there's a lot that, that could happen. It's a heavy lift in the African-American community, and I'm glad that this article pointed out South Carolina, where I'm from, is the only state with a black, primarily black electorate as far as the number of people that's going to happen. Right. Well, so I, I I don't know. I, I I struggle with identity politics, so I'm always cautious about. I don't know it. how you strive. Well, I said it. You heard okay. me. I said it. I struggle with identity politics, but let me throw this out because I gotta get this trap set. 
because <laughs> the issue was Biden gaffes. And Donald Trump spent all week talking about his Man of the Year award oh my goodness. from the state of Michigan. <laughs> that he was given an award for the from the state of Michigan as Man of the Year. And poor Michigan's like, listen, I'm sorry, Donald Trump. We never gave you such an award. And he forced people to agree with him on stage, didn't you? I, I, we were there. You heard my speech when I received the Man of the Year award. Now, if that, I don't know if it's a gaffe. I mean, I want to say that works. That's and, Donald Trump, though. Okay, well, so, so he can gaffe. Yeah. He can stop he's it. A, and, uh, he's the only <laughs> one that can say that can say it and then say the next thing. I didn't say that. Right, but that's not a gaffe. It, it now, the is. other one was this. He went out. Everybody in the world knows America's overweight. And at his speech, he was fat shaming his own supporters. So so much so that the next day he had to call the man and apologize. But he went on about the guy's weight from the stage in New Hampshire. At his last ride. Didn't and it's, yeah, absolutely about the man's size of his weight. Uh and I thought, well, is that not again? It's so much so that the next day he's fat shaming his own supporters and told him to throw the guy out because he was fat. No way. <laughs> you know, I didn't, I didn't see that. I, I can't agree to that. I didn't see it. <laughs> That's okay. You might be you know, putting something I on I watch that. all things Trump. Don't worry about it. I got you covered. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, hey, I, Professor, I appreciate you sitting in for the extra half hour. appreciate uh, 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 DJ CEO. Uh, giving us a little bit more time to talk and yuck it up this morning. And, of course, to all our, our listeners out there and people watching on, on YouTube, we really do appreciate you all. I mean, we really look forward to spending this time with you, as always. Um, we welcome you to stay tuned into the stage. Great music, great great lineup of hosts and guests. Uh, but most of all, just stay engaged in your community. So with that being said, listen, I want everybody to have a great week. This is In Touch News Radio, Reality Radio, everybody's a star. Anything, uh, Professor, you want to add? Um, for my my peeps and my listeners in Orlando, um, Old Town, yeah, uh, Joe Barber, uh, D Line Barber out in Winter Park, looking for good uh, guys, uh, a drug free environment. He's looking for barbers who are thirsty to start their own oh, business. Wow, outstanding! Well, good stuff. Good opportunities. Listen, have a great week. See you back next week.